morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning, and welcome back. Welcome back to the Porsche Cool Podcast. Thursday here in Bahrain. Thursday. Um, is it Thursday? Yes, it's Thursday. Uh, it's Thursday. This is Friday's episode. And, you know, I know you guys have had to bear with me uh, chatting with myself, as I do <laughs> when Steve's not here. That was the week before last. Last week we had Ajmal oh. here stepping in, Steve. But never fear, guys. Steve's back. Hi, Steve. Hi, mate. How are you going? God help us. <laughs> so I want you to give me a um, first. Steve is smiling for all the listeners. He's got a big smile on his face because he's been off making all the moolah, all the lady godivers, all the loot, all the money for the last few weeks. So he's happy. Um, he's very happy. I'm with Ajmal. A what the fuck are you talking about, lady godivers? It's <laughs> like all I can think about is boobs, some naked chick on a horse, um, and B no, like I've made next to zero money um <laughs> things have been a little bit sketchy um i was just telling you prior to this our new ishborn our six month old um is in a is in a world of pain because she only sleeps like about an hour and a half at a time which means we are not sleeping which means it is very tense at home but they say you only need and a couple of hours sleep a night right so you should be okay yeah, you know, high no. profile people, you know, people who are like, you know, committed. No, <laughs> no, no, no to all of that. It's, it's been, yeah, it's been hard. Like in lockdown, I've got to say, like throw lockdown in the mix, like throw a grumpy kids, um, wife, husband, lockdown for what are we? Week 12, I think, in Sydney or longer. You know, you should have said husband before wife then, right? You just did it in the wrong order. You're going to be in trouble because it's always the hump. The husband is grumpier than the wife. So you say husband is grumpy first. She doesn't listen to this. (laughs) Um, Yeah, no, it's been awful. It's been horrible. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I don't know how you've done it. No, well, uh, look, I know I'm I'm starting the podcast by venting, but um, I don't have it any differently from kind of other people. Um, Like I'm sure there's uh, people like friends kind of keep telling me about what homeschooling is like, and that sounds like, you know, bloody awful as well. And yeah, I don't know. It's just, um, it, it does feel like, it does feel particularly kind of tough. And I do put a lot of that down psychologically to, um, you know, week 12 of lockdown, like people's mental health, um, I swear, like not, it's not a good place to be. Yeah, no, it's not. I remember when Bahrain was in that way. Um, here we're starting mm-hmm. with COVID talk again. Well, not COVID, but COVID related. But um, yeah. I remember in Bahrain when it was locked down in 2020 and it was hard here. It was very hard for us mm-hmm. here. Um, yeah. I mean, we could still go to the supermarket, but it, was, it, was, it wasn't easy. It's not easy, especially when you're yeah. not in Europe own home so to speak you know you're in a well it's your yeah, home yeah. temporary but it's not your home so it's not yeah. easy mate and you know a lot of people have been saying that to me in sydney how they just wish it would end you know what i mean they just wish it would end but it seems to be dragging on um did i tell um, you our look, flight was cancelled our flight was cancelled i don't know i haven't spoken spoken to you yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. i, I suppose you remember like um you posted on insta and then i um oh that's right uh, i texted you kind of thing so have you managed to book something like to replace it for as early as you can or no because those are yeah and you said on insta so those of who follow me on insta have seen that and some people responded to me um but mm. it seems there was an article in the new australian papers yesterday and singapore basically just couldn't do it anymore there's an article about how singapore was trying to work with the australian government the australian government just doesn't budge on anything um and the numbers were cut by half and they just couldn't run those flights so they actually did cancel the flights the flights were cancelled right See, I thought they were just we were just bumped for like business class or premium economy or whatever, um, right. but they're actually cancelled, Steve. Um, and I think this is because Australia is in that transition period. And I think I said to someone else yep. the other day, I think I was talking to Tasha's father about it, and it's like, I think what's happened is is that they're going to bring in home quarantine. I think yes. the numbers are been halved into Sydney airport. So it's like, and for people who are listening who don't know what the numbers are, they're like 20 in a flight, 20 people on one flight, which is just absolutely ridiculous. Um, And I think what it is, it's that transition period and they're just waiting and I think then the flights are going to start up again. But I read something in the paper yesterday and this was the Singapore Airlines people quoting and Australian government's direction. And apparently like the 18th is when they're going to let people from Australia travel again, 18th of December. 
And then I think okay. that's probably when hotel quarantine is going to come in. And, you know, and I laughed when I heard it because I said to my wife, I said, I bet you they bring it in three days before Christmas or a week before Christmas where no one can fly then anyway because all the airlines, the prices, one, are going to go up even more. And then you know, mm. everyone's going to be rushing around a week before Christmas to get a flight. You know, it's just become this crazy yeah. thing. And then I searched online. We'll get into Porsche shortly, but I, I searched online and there is no flights from because they only cancelled our uh, Singapore to Sydney leg, and there are actually yep. zip no flights, and not just on Singapore yep. Airlines, on every airline. So it's just yep. it's just crazy. So I don't know what we're going to do. So and are the prices crazy? Um, well, our price for our ticket was cheap, but um, well, I don't know what no, the prices now, are because like no flights come up. No flights come up. Oh, okay, so you can't even check it. Yeah, no, right. can't even check it. Yeah, my sister's um, not stuck, but she like my sister. Um, lives in london recently moved to um helsinki because she kind of got married to a finn and her plan was to long-term live between um helsinki and london but um she hasn't been home to sydney in quite a while and she's busting to see her nieces and like my she'll parents struggle. and all that sort of stuff yeah but, she'll struggle yeah. to get back for sure she keeps asking me what the situation is and it's like oh, i keep referencing you guys sort of saying well <laughs> Even if you book something, you're going to get kind of bumped. So don't do it's, it. It's not good. But I did mention, in, I think in a couple of weeks ago, I did mention the fact that, you know, they left our, yeah. um, they left our uh, London to Singapore leg open. You know, when you book a flight to Sydney on Singapore Airlines, you know, where mm. gold flies, we fly economy most of the time. Um, it's a double leg. It's booked at once, right? But they only cancelled the Singapore to Sydney leg. And uh, Luke at New Car Concierge has been on um, owner stories before. I forgot yeah, that he yeah. used to work for uh, Singapore Airlines. I remember he told me in the podcast. He said to me they yeah. always they do that because they keep the, bu- the booking open. That's why they leave that leg open because they're still keeping the booking open. Otherwise, if they close the leg, there's no booking um, or something like that. Sorry, Luke, I probably got it wrong, but I understand what you were yeah, saying. So thanks, uh, thanks, yeah. Luke, for um, telling me that. That was actually very helpful. Um, yeah. Mate, welcome back. Let's 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 start this week's episode. Um, I have a bit of news. I have <laughs> I a bit of have. news. We have started it. I have a bit of news at the end of the episode too, which um, I hope the listeners aren't too upset about. But we we have to go forward with it because. Um, it's just how it is at the moment. Um, was all right. the Ferrari called podcast? Yeah, Ferrari. I'm buying a Ferrari. Steve, I want to talk about Patreon. I just want to p- go through Patreon very, very quickly because there are two uh, people who have joined who are, you know, uh, good, su- great supporters of the podcast. Um, so two new members of Porsche Cool this week. Um, Patreon. Patreon. Um, I noticed Matt Farah has just done a Patreon page. I just noticed he's got like mm. in, in one week, I think he's got 500 patrons or something. One week. Um <laughs> <laughs> maybe you should maybe you, there you go maybe you should change the podcast to the smoking tire and spell it t-y-r-e i was going to call it the smoking cool it's, podcast what do you think yeah and then see if see if like people accidentally kind of um patreon <laughs> smoking tire By with the wine yeah just get misleading the, get the sloppy misleading, seconds misleading advertising yeah. i don't know if i want to be associated that closely um <laughs> two new two men, two new members for porsche cooled uh patreon just very quickly i know you guys hear this every week and you're probably sick of me hearing it but patreon just supports the podcast it helps keep us talking uh the podcast is not sponsored in any way i've had two people approach me for sponsored instagram posts this week and i turned both of them down um which Blue maybe i'm which maybe I'm crazy. No, no, no. A watch, a watch, and uh, um, something else. I don't forget what it was. A watch was one of them. I'll send you the link. I'll send you the link. Um, it's a watch oh, that's okay. um, watch being done in, in collaboration. It's a watch that's being done in collaboration with someone that makes a version of a 911. It sounds exciting, but it's, when you see it, you'll know what I mean. Um, okay. Two new members of Patreon, Stephen. We all know Stephen. Stephen's been on owner stories before. Stephen is at 66 underscore 912 underscore 6. Um, Stephen is from Sydney. He has a nine, uh, has that uh, 98, 911, but he also has that 1966 um, 912. The 912 that's being hot rotted down in um, Adelaide, the orange one. Um, How's it Steve- going? I don't know about the progress. Stephen, you have to tell me the progress. I forget where, you, where you're up to on that. Um, hmm. I'm looking forward to seeing that car when we get back to Sydney when it's finished. I've told Stephen that already. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing that car. Um, a funny yeah. story there, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pre-launch it. The previous owner of Stephen's car um, is going to be on 
a future owner stories. Um, so he's he's uh, I've been talking to him. I'm not going to let out who it is. People will know who it is if they follow Stephen. But he's going to be on a future owner story. So I'm kind of looking forward to that because it's a really good twist. It's going to be a really good twist in that story. Um, mm-hmm. And then the next person that's joined Steve is. See, I pronounce this Matthew, but it's not. It's Matthew. So Matthew um, joined. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Matthew. Yeah, yeah. your pronunciation is correct. Me up. <laughs> <laughs> so it's Matthew. Matthew's Matthew. Uh, Matthew speaks to me on Instagram. Um, Matthew's got a 997.1. He's owned a few Porsches. Yeah. So he's also joined Porsche Cool. So thank you so much, Matthew, and thank you so much, Stephen. Where's Matthew from? I'm not 100% sure. I'm not 100% sure. Sorry, Matthew, I'm not sure. Um, right. He's only, but he, uh, I'm not 100% sure, Steve. I should know that, but I don't. No, no that's cool. We're just, I'm just. Mm-hmm. going following on from the pronunciation gag it's like well, where's he from you know my French is not my, <laughs> it's not French but my French is not my Matthew's probably laughing at me no Matthew's name is spelled M-A-T-H-I-U right so I yeah, wasn't I'm... sure whether it was Matthew or Matthew but it's, it's definitely Matthew um, well right. I think it's Matthew um, Natasha speaks a bit of French so she helped me but she said it's Matthew Anyway, Patreon helps keep us talking. Uh, if you go there, just go to patreon.com slash Porsche Cooled, um, 2 to $10 a week. It really does help us. So if you can, uh, if you can contribute there, that would be fantastic. So last week, Steve, uh, mm-hmm. I had someone lined up. And this is, I don't want to, I know this person's probably listening. And honestly, I'm not upset with you. It's all cool. Um, but I had someone that was, I, I wasn't, I wasn't prepared. Um, I wasn't prepared in the fact that I had, Work is crazy. Um, our projects that started in twenty that we started working on in twenty eighteen, they were delayed for one year due to COVID. Um, multiple projects on this big event in Dubai that's opening on the first of October, as you know, are all coming to a head. So my time has been really poor. Like I haven't had a lot of time to to organise owner stories. I had a, a couple of owner stories um, that I was planning, and then I had to cancel somebody. I cancelled someone because I could just couldn't do it because I had a client meeting and it was just a nightmare day that day. So. Then the other day, I had someone to do owner stories. It was on Sunday. I think it was Sunday night my time, Steve. And you know Sunday night my time is really leaving it short because I edit on Sunday to put it up on Patreon on Monday because the Patreon members get it 24 hours in advance. Uh, And the guy that I wanted to talk to, he had to cancel. Um, No fault of his own, but he had to cancel. So then I was left without an owner stories. Mm -hmm. So I was stressing out. I was stressing out. And then I had Ajmal in the back of my head you know, saying, why don't you do your own owner story? And I thought, I don't want to do that <laughs> because Ajmal's little voice was there with his little emoji face looking at me saying, do your own story, do your own story. Yeah, and his flat <laughs> cap. And Ajmal, I know you're listening as well. Um, so I thought, okay, um, even though uh, it was a very difficult time to record, I just uh, recorded a quick chat, which I've had a lot of good feedback for, so I really appreciate everyone for, for doing that. Um, you know, I had no choice. I was cornered, really. But I just didn't want to do have no episode for owner stories, so um, I did it. And mm-hmm. um, what else, Steve? What else? Ajmal, last week, what did you think? Did you listen to it? I did. I did. I did. So yeah, he, he's looking for I a boxster, a boxster for two thousand pounds. Yeah, I think he's mental, but. Um... <laughs> Uh, but like no uh, gags aside, I don't really know enough about it. I you just sort of hear t- sort of differing kind of opinions as to um, you know like uh, I think you sort of said it to him actually, which was Matt Farrer and Zach Clapman like constantly sort of say don't touch a nine eight six Boxster because they're kind of fraught with danger. Um, I I just don't know. I have no no real understanding or knowledge of it. I, um, if I was in that sort of position or if you were kind of seriously going, hey, what do you reckon about this? My first thing would be to ring up um, Granted Auto House and go, okay, so what's the story like um, with 986 Box? Does are they reliable or are they not? Um, well, I think that if, if one came up in Australia for, and 2,000 pounds yeah. for the listeners is about 3,600 Australian dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, is that crazy? Is crazy. Or what? Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, Three thousand six hundred Australian dollars. Yeah. So if you if you um, if you got one for three thousand six hundred dollars, I think I would be a little bit concerned. I think I would be a little bit concerned if I bought one in in Australia for that because it would be a shit box. It would be terrible. And Whoa. you know, my comparison my comparison for 
a cheap boxster, and I don't know how much he paid for it. And I know he listens to the podcast, actually, Home Built by Jeff, who's yeah. got a YouTube channel. And if you haven't seen his YouTube channel, you should have a look, because I have mentioned before, he's got a really... <laughs> A really that unique project. I'll, ca- I'll call it a unique project, and I'm always amazed yeah. by uh, Jeff Schools. You know, I, and he's he's got a unique project where he's putting a Audi A6 engine into a 986 Boxster. Now, yeah, is that is that the V8? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's V8, I, is it? No, I've kind of watched his videos here and there, and um, I haven't watched them. I haven't watched anything in a very long time. But um, I saw like the caption for it, but. Was that, is he putting a V8 or a V6 in it? Uh, you know what? I should know that. Wouldn't fit, would it? I think it's a V6. I thought it was a V6 out of an Audi A6. I, I probably got that wrong, so I really apologize if I have. I oh, should I know look that. look it up while we're talking. Have a look and Keep tell going. me for sure if it's a V8. But you know what I mean? If people want to see, and, and Jeff, no offense if you are listening to this episode, if you really want to see a really messed up Boxster when he first bought it, have a look at the very first video oh, of, yeah. that, of that series. Like that Boxster, I don't know what the person was thinking. You know, you see these cars and you think, oh, my God, you know, what are these people thinking um, when they do these cars like this? But, I, I, you know, I would be as a V8, is it? OK, so I was wrong. Yep. It's a V8. Yeah. So to me, if, you, if you're going to get a cheap Boxster, that's what you get. And if you're not like someone like Jeff from Home Built by Jeff, if you're not someone that can do the work on the car and, and or you want to make it like a, a different sort of car, like a track car, which is what he's doing, then I think you have to stay away at that price. Um, Ajmal thinks that it's going to be okay. He's going to take it to flat six Jack and Jack's going to check it. And then he's just going to sell it off and hopefully get his money back, which he probably will because boxers are increasing oh, in price. Yeah. As long as it doesn't fall to bits. Like I know, I think he sort of said something like, you know, for that sort of money, he just wants it to kind of be in, you know, sort of basic running order. I'm assuming that means that there might be certain things that don't work, but that doesn't kind of matter. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, I kind of understand. I kind of understand it, but I think just the worst part of it would be like if things that are important, like headlights or you know, air conditioning, or maybe air conditioning doesn't matter. But if certain things start to kind of fail, like every 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 time something starts to fail, how expensive is that going to be to fix it? True. I mean, you can't really keep it for that long, can you? You'd have to be very careful. You have to be very very careful. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I, I have no experience in that area. But I, but I think that, you know, putting that Audi engine in that Boxster is, is crazy. Hey, I meant, to, I meant to think, I was going to send it to you and I don't think I did. Um, and anyone that owns Macans who's listening um, and want to get, who wants to put the Apple CarPlay in, did you see he also had a video on putting that Apple CarPlay system? I think it's the same system that James at Auto Amateur um, sells oh, and does. Joy, Joy Auto, that's yeah. in China. But it, you know, he made it, uh, Jeff made it look easy, but... Honestly, it wasn't. Um, it didn't look like an easy process to me to no, put that in. I was watching it going. It have you looked at? Yeah. Have you seen his video? I haven't seen his video, but I've looked it up because I was at one point. I kind of was kind of getting the shits with um, the one in my wife's car not having um, CarPlay, but it just looked too looked like too much work because you've actually got to pull like you know <laughs> what to me look like you know chips, microchips, and all that kind of stuff out of it and it's like i'm not touching that and you got to do a bit of soldering and everything's like whoa <laughs> he makes it look easy he makes it look easy but the first thing that happens and i'm going to give it away is you have to take your air vents out your air conditioning vents yeah no and he yeah, breaks yeah. one the first thing he does he breaks one right because you know it's not easy uh, i mean i'm just looking at it going yeah, yeah look- I-, I would fail I- i'm looking at it, watching it going yeah i would fail on that one i would not do it <laughs> he's got skills so like i'm sure he can kind of do it but um because I'd sort of thought about getting um, Chris Green at Radios in Motion, you know, like the Porsche dude. And, and I don't think I actually ever asked him, but I wondered whether or not Chris would be willing to do it. But my bet is that, like, for the trouble that he has to kind of go through to pull, you know, like the console and the vents and all that sort of stuff apart and then literally crack open, you know, the head unit to kind of and do a little bit of soldering and all that type of stuff, it's like, eh, it probably would wind up being too expensive to kind of do it and just not worth it. Okay, here's a question. Don't you think it's a bit weird? Um, and is this a licensing thing? I don't know whether this is a licensing thing or not, but don't you think it's a bit weird that you've got Joy Auto, or Joy Auto who does this mm. upgrade to put Apple Maps and Apple CarPlay on on your um, PCM, you know, in Macan's yeah. and in yeah. 901.1s, 901.1s, right, basically, which is like yeah, the Macan, yeah. same system, right? Um, don't you think it's weird, though, that it can be done and, app, and Porsche could actually do a module that they do in the dealership and do this for you, but they don't? 
Mm, because no, it can be done. But it would be breaking. It would, surely it would be breaking like Apple licensing kind of things and stuff. So like, there's no way that um, Porsche as a brand could be associated with kind of doing dodgy stuff like hacking, <laughs> hacking um, head units. So you're saying it's illegal. <laughs> These things are illegal. James, the Lord Amateur, yeah, you're like, selling illegal products, is he? Is that what's happening? It's like um, the Seinfeld episode with the Russians coming in to install the, um, the not pay TV, what do you call it in the States? That's a funny episode. That's a funny yeah, episode. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of comedians, um, I really like, um, I've always really enjoyed watching Norm MacDonald. And it was really sad that he passed away yesterday. I don't know if you've ever watched any of his stuff. I used to watch his show on YouTube where he had the interview and no. old footage. Do a search on YouTube. If you don't know about Norm MacDonald, he's dry, he's... I thought he was a really right. funny guy. Funny guy. He died yesterday. He had cancer. He's been fighting cancer for ten years. I but saw he's a, something, but I didn't didn't know who the who the guy actually was. So I watch some of his stuff on on YouTube. He's, it's very very funny. He's very funny. I find him very yeah, funny. Right. He was very dry, very um, very my sort of humor. My sort of humor. So no to the uh, no to the upgrade of the maps then on the Macan, Steve. Mm, if it was a couple of hundred bucks, yes. If it was more than a thousand bucks, no. Nah. Maybe if um, Joy Auto listened to this podcast, they could send you a free one and then you could actually do it. You'd do it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think so. <laughs> but the, you'll get no pictures on Instagram. You'll get no video. You'll get nothing, Joy Auto. You'll just get Steve enjoying the Apple CarPlay eventually. You won't get, you won't get, any, you won't get any, any return. You'll get that? no exposure. <laughs> How's that for a sponsorship deal? <laughs> That's a good sponsorship deal, I reckon. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm curious Steve. to know what watch approached you. Uh, I'll say, I don't really want to mention it on the podcast because I just in case they listen to it, I don't want to bag them on. I don't want to bag them on the podcast, but um, I okay. will. Um, I, I will. I will send it to. I will send it to you. I'm just a guest. Um, interesting though. If anyone wants to know how these things work, I got an email. I got a DM, hmm. um, and they offered. Uh, they wanted me to do Instagram posts. Um, I did my Vago, ret- Vago response saying I don't know what these things are worth when I actually did have an idea of what they're worth. And they basically, <laughs> and they basically, well, I did because I, you, you know, I you look know at everything. You. <laughs> yeah. And basically, um, well, I'm not mentioning their name, so it could be anyone. And basically, they, um, they offered me 150 US dollars. And I think the listeners might find this interesting because this is what people make money out of. 150 US dollars to do three posts. And three Instagram three posts. three posts, yeah, and three Instagram stories. Now, if I'm doing three posts and three Instagram stories, and you know that I don't do any sponsored posts, and this is on Porsche Cool that has, mm-hmm. you know, sub 18,000 followers. Mm-hmm. As a rule, it, it really works like it should be. If you have 180,000 fo- uh, 18, followers, it should be about 180. But that is for one post. That is not for a post and a story. Yeah, I was going to say, it's a bit cheap, isn't it? It's way too cheap. Yeah, it's way too cheap. Um, I turned Maybe it down you don't anyway. Get out of bed for more than a thousand bucks a day, do you? Or less than a thousand bucks a day? I don't really want to go down that track because it's like I, you know, I put watches on Michael.bath, as you know. You know, we're both, you know, we both like watches, we both collect watches. I don't really want to put a watch on my Instagram that I don't like, that I wouldn't, mm. I wouldn't wear and I wouldn't buy as well. Like, yeah, I think that's a bit Everything wrong. has a price, mate. I think that's a bit wrong. If they offer me $1 million, maybe, then I'd say yes. Yeah, everything has a price. Like, I'm surprised <laughs> at TGE. I can't even remember the brand of that heinous Turbulon. Oh, man. That transparent thing that he kind oh, of keeps. Yeah. How hideous is that? Yeah, and even that thing that opens his, um, you know, turns, like, uh, replaces his ignition, gets him into his cars, that other one, that's. That's bloody awful as well. <laughs> yeah, that Centurion key. I don't oh, understand it. that Centurion, Centurion yeah. key. That's in London um, opposite. I always say this wrong too. I hope I'm not going to get the pronunciation wrong. People, All the English listeners are going to have a got me. Barclay Square. I think it's Barclay Square. I used to think it was Berkeley Square, but it's Barclay Square in, in Mayfair and their shop is just there. Mm-hmm. But I don't mm-hmm. understand those watches. Why do you want that on your wrist? One, it's ugly. Two, it costs like... 20,000 pounds or something <laughs> like <laughs> I'm going to wear this ugly watch that's 20,000 pounds that I hate to open my car which I can do with my key why would I use this watch I, I, I just maybe don't we, I don't understand maybe it you've I don't started do this it. new thing like instead of being paid um, for sponsorships it's like the anti-sponsorship podcast where you basically <laughs> Centurion Key if they're listening they should contact us and tell us why we need that key because I don't understand why you would want that key to start your supercar or your Porsche honestly I just don't get it it's just if anyone hasn't seen it go and have a look it's one of those it reminds me of one of those fashion watches from the 90s that 
that used to be in really cheap stores that were gray and multiple layers like a skyscraper on your wrist. It's like, why would I wear that? Okay, so if you have the choice, if, if I've got a gun to your head and you have to choose between that Centurion thing and the other horrible Turbion kind of clear thing that he's sort of obviously sponsored <laughs> by, which one? You have to wear one for a day. Mm, I'd probably take the clear in one. In the middle of London. I'd probably take the clear one, but I don't want to wear any of them. I don't want to wear any of them. <laughs> Seriously. Okay, so then here's another one for you. Have you seen, have you seen, I think I spotted it because Suncoast um, sent an email out. We love um, Suncoast, by the way. Suncoast, we love you. You're great. <laughs> <laughs> so they were flogging the fact that um, uh, Porsche design watches, they had, I thought, because I kind of thought that the, that new sort of watch, whatever it is, the chrono, the chronograph um, and Suncoast, um, I thought yeah. you could only get it if you bought a GT3. I thought so too. I thought so too, so, but apparently not. Tell the story, Steve. So in your humble watch opinion, would you wear that watch? Um, I don't know. I looked, I'm looking at it now. I'm just loading it up. I, had a, I did an owner stories last night. I did an owner stories last night, which is coming up in a few weeks um, hmm. with Paul um, from London. And I told him about that watch that asked me to uh, you know, do a sponsored post and I sent it to him and he thought it was hideous as well. Yep. And then he sent me a picture of his Porsche design watch, you know, the original sort of Porsche design watch that we both love. Oh, the original Orfina. Yeah, I think it's the Orfina yeah. one that he had, yeah. And I go back to that watch yeah. and, you know, I think us, everyone who's listening and, and you and I as Porsche enthusiasts, I think we all should try to get that watch. Um, you know, it's a watch no, that I... Huh? <laughs> it's too expensive. <laughs> it's not expensive, is it? Yeah. 10 grand I, or something, well, right? 10 or 12 grand, right? Yes. How expensive <laughs> is it for what you're getting? <laughs> All right. Actually, I noticed that um, AP posted, was it AP or Frank Wallace or one of them right. sort of posted that they had one as well? Like, nah, the horse is bolted on that. I Like I, I said in a couple of podcasts ago, I, I was hunting for one of those ages ago and I think I turned it down at like $1,200. <laughs> you should have, man, <laughs> that was, now. yeah, that was a mistake. That's like, yeah, yeah that's a mistake. That's like me missing out on a 996 GT3 for um, 90000 95000 dollars. Small mistake. Yeah, Just small mistake. mistake. If I would have done that now, I would have had three hundred thousand because that's how much they're selling for in Australia. They're selling for <laughs> Classic Throttle Shop, another company that we really love. I know he sometimes listens to the podcast. Three hundred, uh-huh. almost not three hundred thousand. It's two hundred and eighty, right? But if it's plus plus on roads, yeah. it'd be three hundred. Three hundred thousand for a nine nine six GT3. And here is mm-hmm. here I am talking, you know. Porsche stories here and, and talking about Porsche and I'm the idiot that let one pass for ninety five, ninety nine thousand dollars. I not just one, there was like three or four available at the time. So what a mistake yeah, that anyway. was. <laughs> so we, would you wear one of these Porsche design watches? Okay, I'm looking at them now in Suncoast. People can go to Suncoast and have a look at it. I don't know what they're called. Um, but you're right. It's a very weird thing because you can you can do them like your car. I mean, it's clever, I guess, that you can actually option them out like your car. You can do the custom colors and whatever. There is the GT3 mm. Touring custom watch. Um, is that mm. is this based on the new 992, though, or is it an old one? Is mm, the one that comes sure. with the car, the, the GT3, a different watch? Maybe it's a different watch. Mm, I don't know. It looks similar. They're, I mean, they're very similar design. See, design. I, I don't understand it. I don't understand why it gets so complicated. You know, the plain, in all honesty, um, the Porsche design custom watch leather band, the black, the plain black one, the plain black one, which is just showing a yellow ring around it with the two dials, it's not hideous. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've seen but that one. It's seven grand? No, it's five grand. 5,000 5, US. It's a lot of money for a Porsche, Porsche design watch, honestly. Mm-hmm. But, it, you know, it's, it's black. It's, uh, you know, it's got a yellow band. It's got the two sub dials. Um, at 12 and 6 it's not bad that one's like 5 there's titanium which you want to get titanium that's almost 5 and a half that's 5 to 6 then 7 6 the custom one so if you want to custom it out you're right Steve you only get the yellow for that price so if you want to custom the watch this is where it gets crazy right and I think you know honestly go and buy a Rolex or buy a Panerai um, you've got <laughs> oh, seriously that so five, the, I've been waiting five, for it the answer is no <laughs> no because <laughs> I don't understand how you can have a watch at 5695 And this is cheaper on Suncoast. They're discounted, right? And this is mm-hmm. – it says custom watch titanium band. But then, oh, the GT3 one is 7695 So they're all custom. You can change the color of all of them. Uh, I would buy the old one. 
I would still buy the old one. I would, I would just bite the bullet and, and, and get the old one. What do you think, Steve? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, like, no, I wouldn't get one of these watches. I can't. I, I just um, lots of car guys are watch guys, right? So I'm sure yeah. a lot of people listening to this are well, and, uh, and I, you already know this because you talk to them and I know you want, wind up yeah. having the odd conversation. I know not everybody's into kind of their watches, but I just... I'm kind of curious, like genuinely without sort of taking the piss as to what type of person um, who's well into their kind of cars would fork out like, you know, seven, 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 seven thousand seven hundred US for like a Porsche design watch. Cause that's a lot of money. I don't want to offend anyone. I have a category of people. Go on. Offend, no, I have a category of person that would buy that watch and I don't want to offend anyone just in case there are people listening to it. And I can relate it to I can relate it to fashion being in fashion in my earlier life and I can relate okay. it to a Italian brand that I used to work for and people that used to buy clothing from there and the suits from there. And we're talking about at the time suits that used to cost $8,000 Australian. Does it rhyme with Hamani? <laughs> a cashmere, you know, a cashmere, a cashmere sweater at the time used to cost four thousand, um, and at one no. stage, you know, which is which is just in crazy. Um, so I kind of relate it to that thing. You yeah, know what I mean? Sure, sure, sure. Like it, oh, no. it's yep. it's not that you don't know; it's just that maybe you've gone a little bit off track. You know what I'm saying? Maybe you've gone a little bit off track. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of great watches. And we have a lot of watch uh, enthusiasts who, who listen to the podcast. I've had quite a few on owner stories. Um, I really loved, you know, Brian's, uh, Brian that's been on um, the, the class a few weeks ago, um, Manuel996 on Instagram. Brian, um, I know yeah. you're listening from um, Silicon Valley. Brian's a, you know, a watch fan. He's a fanatic. He's, he's a, an avid watch collector. Um, and I've talked to him about watches backwards and forwards on Instagram as well now. And, you know, mm-hmm. his, analogy, his analogy for, like, watches and Porsches I thought was quite good. You know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, you know, it's, you know, box and papers and, you know, box and papers with the watch and then, you know, full detailed service history. And then, you know, he made the point the other day about, what did Brian tell me? I'm going to lose my memory here. Oh, about how Oyster Perpetuals, people who don't know, there's a Rolex model called an Oyster Perpetual and a Datejust. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Datejust and Oyster Perpetual... The kind of watches that you could kind of joke about and you could always go into Rolex and find that would always be there, right? Um, recently, no, Rolex, recently, well, I can tell you a story about this too, which happened this week. Um, and I think yeah. I've told you already, but yeah, Rolex yeah. Oyster Perpetual, they, they introduced colors. They changed all the dials to colors, Tiffany blue, green, silver, black, you know, and now they're selling like crazy. And, and the day just is selling really well too, because it has a blue dial and you can get it, you know, it's like you can spec it out. And, and it's a bit like he sort of did the comparison to like the 996 Boxster, how, you know, they're not really loved. And then all of a sudden these things are, it just changes overnight. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Which it does, which it has, you know what I mean? And I went to, you know, I had, we're talking about watches for a second, but I had the opportunity. I want a uh, Oyster Perpetual Rolex and I want the silver dial. Mm-hmm. Steve knows about this. I don't want the colored mm-hmm. ones. In London, I was on the waiting list for it, and I was told that it should be easy because most people don't want that watch. We went into Rolex in Bahrain uh, a week ago. They don't want that watch. I thought it was really popular. They don't want the silver dial. They want the colors. Oh, really? The colors have okay. a year and a half wait in London, he said to me. He said, oh, if you want the silver one, that's okay. I can get you one of those reasonably quickly. I've reached out to the guy again after my encounter in Rolex Bahrain, and he, uh-huh. um, he's... You know, I, I think I'm still going to... I think I should be able to get one from London. Mm-hmm. Well, I hope so because I just turned down the one in Bahrain for obvious reasons. <clears throat> so, you know, this watch, um, you know, bearing in mind I've bought a few watches from this from this boutique. And mm-hmm. this watch is... There's one available. I went in there. The guy said... I said, do you have one? He said, don't know. They always say that. Then a day later they say they have one. Um, the mm-hmm. girl that I deal with sent me a message back saying she has one. I said, but it's, what's the price for me, you know? Um, considering what I've bought from you. For you? And, <laughs> yeah, and I'll, and I'll pay cash as always. What's the, what's the price for me? You're expecting a discount, but no, there's a Michael Bath premium. <laughs> yeah, so they didn't give me any discount. And I'll just, you know, I don't want to bag them. Um, and, I, you know, this is just how it works here sometimes. But the demand of that watch mm-hmm. is so great, they decided to put the watch up by 700 dinar. Now, 700 dinner is about 2,500, 2,600 Australian dollars uh, for other listeners mm-hmm. who work that. So it's got a premium of it. Of that price now that and bearing in mind the price that it was originally at is already a premium 
over the UK price because there, there's always I a small... I didn't think you could do it. I genuinely didn't think that a, a, an official Rolex um, boutique I thought like it was a fixed price. How can you kind of hike the price on it? No, all the Rolex, and this is, I think I did mention this to you. This is a bit like Porsche going to a Porsche dealer, right? Asking over sticker, asking over sticker, which they do. If Porsche it, dealers put it over sticker. But if it's a used Porsche, then they can ask over sticker. No. But if it's a brand new one. No, because you didn't you hear on Spike's car radio, they've just ordered, they want to order, uh, was it a Touring? No, was it a Touring yeah. or something? No, it wasn't a, yeah, touring. a touring. It was. Was it was the one they're ordering from that guy the they order and silver touring? Maybe it was an old episode. And and Zuckerman was saying they want to, you know, we can get one, we can order one, but there's a premium on it. And there was a premium on it and from a Porsche dealer. He said that it's a premium. And Spike said, mm-hmm. I don't want to pay over sticker. I don't. I never want to pay over sticker. Yeah. So maybe they maybe they can deal it. Maybe it's at the discretion of the dealer. They shouldn't be though, right? Like technically, if you're an official dealer, you can't be selling cars, Rolexes, whatever over. Over the RRP. Oh, but I think they do, though, Steve. I don't know. They somehow do, don't they? They do. They do with the special editions. They wouldn't want people talking about it like the way that we are. Yeah, they wouldn't. But (laughs) it's been talked about. Spike was talking about it. He said, I don't want to do that. I I don't want to pay another 40 grand or whatever whatever it was over sticker. And I guess this is the same as the watch, you know. And I really wanted this watch, okay. Um, And I hate it when there's something there that I want because, you know, I, I, I can't sleep. I keep thinking about it. And you know what made it worse? You know what made it worse? Here I am talking to the manager of the store because the girl that looks after me wasn't there. And then Tasha comes yeah. up with the Rolex magazine. Now, I've been buying Rolex magazines off eBay. I've been one of those stupid people that's been paying ridiculous money for them because I'm trying to get the whole yeah. set of the Rolex magazine. Um, I'm yet to get the whole set. Okay. I, but, so Tasha brings me a Rolex magazine. I'm going, oh, I haven't got this one. This is a new one. And what's on the damn cover of the magazine? Mm-hmm. The Oyster Perpetual, not in blue, not in green, not in red. In silver mm. dial. So, you know, like once I saw that, I thought, okay, this conversation is going to go. This, this is not good. And then he tells me the price. He said, oh, due to demand, we'll put the price up. It's yeah. like, okay. So, but I said it was, you know, it was only 2600 um, you know, a few months ago. He said, yeah, that was before, mm. that, before everyone wanted them. <laughs> yeah. So that's like I, going to your Porsche I, dealer and saying, I want a GT3. Well, we have a GT3 for you here in Australia. It's 400000 retail, but we can get you one on allocation. We, we're happy to help you. It's going to be 500000 Would you take it, Steve? Yeah, which, no, I would not. Even though well, you possibly could get your money back? Mm, it's too weird a hypothetical because, like, I need to know how rich I am and all of that sort of stuff. Well, you're alongside you're super rich that. already. So what are you talking about? No, I'm, I'm not super rich already. I need, and like, if that's the case, then I need to kind of be super, 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 super rich. Yeah. Like, yeah, I don't know. It's just um, paying overs for it just is kind of weird. Like, I get it if you're going to an aftermarket sort of, you know, car dealer or watch dealer. But if you're walking into the brand boutique, then it should be the recommended retail price. Otherwise, what's the point in having a recommended retail price? Then, Because you may as well kind of go in as like, Whoever you are on the spot, when you kind of go, hey, I'd like to buy that um, seven eight, like base 718 um, Boxster. It's like, oh, for you, we'll charge you. We don't really <laughs> like the look of you. We'll, we'll just charge you another five grand because we just don't like the cut of your jib. Like, that's just weird that the price – this is weird no. that the price can fluctuate. Look, look I, have a, I have a limit, right, where I'll pay extra. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, yep. You know, like in Bahrain. And, you know, in Bahrain – you know, I, I tip people and I'm I, I'm generous because I know these people, like a lot of people don't earn a lot of money, right? A lot of the, lot of the main workers, they don't earn a lot of money. And I'm generous. And sure, I think sure, sure. that's okay. You know, one dinner or two dinner for me, it's like it's not a lot of money. You know what I mean? I'm not saying I'm rich, but it's not a lot of money. And, and But you are rich. To, but to do something for someone that appreciates that amount of money so much, you know, $8 Australian, that appreciates it so much and you give it to them and you can see they appreciate it so much, to me is like it... it it, it doesn't matter, right? When you're buying yeah, something, yeah, yeah. when you're buying something, when I bought all my Rolexes, and this is probably the same if we talk about Porsches as well, I want to talk about used market Porsches just quickly about that because I have a bit of a, another <laughs> thought in my head um, <laughs> about overvalue. Episode. About <laughs> overvalue. No, and I, you know, and I'll be honest, every watch that I bought from Rolex Bahrain has been slightly more expensive. Slightly now, over. Yeah, sure. Slightly over. But it's only been slightly over. And, you know, when I talk slightly, I'm not talking $10 here. I'm talking, you know, still thousand odd whatever dollars right but the price that i'm buying at is still 
less than the gray market for these watches. For anyone that doesn't know, you can't go into a Rolex boutique and say, I want a sports watch, I want a Submariner, or I want a Daytona. Doesn't Daytona, good luck, you'll never get one. Um, you can't just buy one. But you can go to a gray market dealer, and you can go to good gray market dealers, and they have the watches. And, you know, you can pay $50,000, 50,000 US or 40,000 US or 30,000 US, I think it is now. 30,000, is it 40? 40,000 US, I think, for a Rolex Daytona. A watch that mm-hmm. costs half that at retail. That someone's mm-hmm. somehow got an allocation, they bought it, it hasn't been worn, it's bought in, you know, October, September 2021, and they're selling it. They've sold it and they're making a big margin on it. It happens a lot here in Bahrain. There's dealers down in, the, um, in Bahrain here that, that have a lot of Rolexes. Mm-hmm. Now, I weigh it up, Steve, and I think, okay, it's a little bit more. It's cheaper than grey market. I'm still buying from a Rolex AD. I'm still getting, you know, a full stickered watch here in Bahrain. I'm getting proper warranty. It's in my name. It makes me feel mm-hmm. better. I'm okay with it because I've got something quite rare, and I managed to get a very rare watch from them, which, you know, I wouldn't have got anywhere else, which is the, the mm-hmm. BLNR um, GMT Master II, Batman, Batgirl, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it. So that mm-hmm. I'm fine with all my watches, and all my watches have appreciated since I bought them two years ago. Um, over the last two years, every watch I bought over two years is still much higher. Like my mm-hmm. um, my Explorer Two watch has gone up by fifty percent since I bought it, which is insane. Mm-hmm. On Chrono Twenty Four, which is where I get prices, it's gone up. So that's okay. But when a watch is like, you know, should have been this price and it was already a few hundred dinner more than what the UK price is, well then I have a slight issue paying it. So I had to turn it down. As much as it killed me to turn it down because I wanted it. Um, so hopefully mm-hmm. I can get one in London at normal retail, which is you know. A lot cheaper. So, back to the Porsche thing. You go into your Porsche dealer, you want a 911 Carrera S. He says, look, I can give you a 911 Carrera S, uh, 992 uh-huh. Carrera S. You can do that. You can option it out. But unfortunately, at the moment, there's a silicon, there's a computer chip shortage. You know, Porsche's, you know, half the workforce are working from home, so the cars are made a lot slower because they're working from home. Yep. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? You can have this career rest, but unfortunately in Australia you're going to have to if you you're going to have to pay twenty five thousand on top of the norm of what you spec it out for. Mm-hmm. Now, is this this is not happening at the moment, right? But I'm sure it is happening in some markets. I'm sure it's happening in some markets because people want to jump the queue, and people that have money that want to jump the queue will pay the money to jump the queue. Mm-hmm. So then we go to you know you're going to buy your new car and they're asking you for you know, they're, they're doing a dealer, what do you call it? Dealer add-on or whatever, bub sticker as they call it in the US. Right. How is that any different to going to buy a 996 GT3 for $290,000? Is there the value in a 996.2 GT3 at 290000 Australian dollars when yes, not that is. long ago they were 150? How do you see the difference? Yes, there is. Because that is a defined thing. So because that is an older car, um, you know what the numbers are, so it's rare. Like if you're, if, if I'm taking you literally for a second, you said like a 992 Carrera, like you know, ordered, built brand new, 2021, 2022 year model now. Um, okay, what about a GT3 Touring? You know, it's the same sort of thing. No, right? that's different. That's different because like the difference is like a GT product has a finite kind of numbers. And it is more guaranteed that that thing will appreciate. Like if you, if you're kind of stupid enough to pay another twenty five k on your Carrera, your bog standard nine nine two Carrera, because you're so anxious and you can't, you want to jump the waiting list and all of that sort of stuff. I think you should lose your twenty five grand because you're so sort of uh, assuming that um, like that the value is kind of in that like. The value is in the GT car because it is rare. It's already kind of considered as, you know, sort of something with provenance and all that kind of stuff. So it's held its value because it's a proven kind of thing. Like I, unlike sometimes you maybe, uh, I don't think that every sort of single Porsche known to man is going to appreciate in value. Like I, I, you know, I don't reckon it's kind of like a guaranteed thing that like all sort of Porsches will... Um, sort of hold hold the value. Like I think GT cars will, um, and they probably still will kind of keep going up, but I don't think everything will. Like I don't think, for example, if you went and bought a Boxster, like so call it like a 98, not not Ajmal's 2,000 pound Boxster, but if you went out and bought like whatever, I don't know what they are right now. If you went and bought a, a good 
sort of nine eight six box to do I think that you're going to make money on it? Yeah. No, I don't. Huh? I don't reckon. I think you. I found one. Oh, did okay. I, I found a grey one in Melbourne? Have a look on car sales. It's forty four thousand. It's perfect condition. I thought. Yeah, you, but I, that, my my thing is they'll go no, up to sixty. They'll go up to sixty in a year's time, at least. Yeah, for that. but you're guessing. Like you don't like. It, it's no different from playing shares or crypto or whatever. Like you are guessing. You have no. You don't really know for sure that that thing. But it's um, based on some sort of data, though. It is based on it is based on previous trends, right? Yes, but like we're in kind of odd times in terms of like you know people kind of bizarrely sort of spending COVID money on things and all of that sort of stuff. Like you know, like all it takes is for like a couple of bits of bad press and like you know people sort of saying what like a complete piece of shit that thing is and it do, it'll fall apart and then all of a sudden it drops so you don't i don't think you could be certain that like um you know like an old porsche like that for example is definitely going to appreciate like i wouldn't i don't think it's safe money but you don't um, that's my opinion yeah really Depends you think you only you it, think obviously. only GT cars are safe money. So you think if you buy a, no. you know, and I love the nine eight nine 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 six GT three, and I know people who own them. People have been on owner stories, and I love them. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But yep. It, it, yep, yep, you yep. know, maybe if I came into a lot of funds, it, it wouldn't worry me so much. But when I'm getting up to that, close to three hundred thousand Australian dollars, I yep. would, I would, honestly, for me, I would take it up a step, and. Uh, you know, maybe the, you'll lose money in the short term, but long term, maybe not. I would still go to yep. the 991.2 GT3. I would look for a manual. If it comes in crayon or cloud, which I know there was a couple available, I would buy it because I love that color or GT silver and I would buy that and I would hang on to it. Um, and you still buy them at 300? They've gone beyond 300 now, haven't they? They're 360. That's what I'm saying. For another, if you're going to yep. that point, for me, see, as much as I like the 996 GT3, I would. And I know it's a, a raw driving experience and I know there's a lot of benefits of it and it's different to the modern cars, right? But I would still yeah, sure. go to a 901.2 uh, GT3 or I would go yeah. to a 991.1 GT3 RS. And I know they're, they're both about the same price in Australia at the moment. They're yeah, both yeah. sitting yeah. around 360. There's a great la- – I love the lava orange in the 991.1 GT3 RS. Tasha says it's like yeah. too bright, but I love it. And there's a really good one for sale at the moment, but it's got the orange inserts, and it's I think it's 365 or 369. There's a silver one at, at Golson's in Canberra, yep. which is about the same price. There's quite a few on the market at the moment, but you know that 360 for the listeners overseas listening, that 360 becomes 400. You know, it really is a 400,000 car because you've got to pay the the tax, um, this, whatever it's called, stamp duty, right? So it is it is quite yeah, expensive. Yeah. Yep. But I think there's a bit of a dilemma here, Steve, and this is what I'm I'm kind of leading to a point here. You know, you're out, you, you want something special, <laughs> right? You want something special. You yeah. want a special watch. You want a special yep. car. You know, sometimes yep. you have to pay a premium. It, it's annoying. It's annoying because, like I said, I really wanted that watch. And it's the same as someone really wanting a Porsche but not wanting to pay a premium, you know. Yep. Um, yep, and maybe yep. that's like the 911R. was sold at 450 went up to $1.1 million in Australia, went down to about 670 Australian. Um, few come on the market and they all dried up. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, because people yep. saw the value in that. Now it's still. Let's bear in mind, it's still six hundred odd thousand Australian. It's still one hundred and fifty thousand over the sale price. How many years later? Three years later, right? At least three years yep. later. I don't know what year it came out. But if you wanted that much, I, do you want it? So what do you do though? You get a Porsche dilemma. You want something special in Porsche. You want like a rare model. Anything rare that comes up, whether it be a Cayman, a Cayman R, or a Touring now, or a, you know, Tourings have gone crazy worldwide. The prices of Tourings, or a, hmm. you know, even a 911, the Carrera T, you know, the Carrera T 911, the one that came out, they're still yep. holding value. So if you want something special, what do you do? Do you get a classic? You know what I mean? And I found this article. Well, it's not an article actually. It came from 912 BBBS, BBS forum, um, hmm. and it was about restoration costs. Because in my head, I'm thinking, you know, pick up a cheap 912, and I've said this before. Or even a cheap 911T body, if you can find one. doesn't matter what condition it's in, Steve, because everything's fixable. <laughs> and redo the engine and fix it up, right? And then I saw this article, and it scared me. It scared me. And I know there's yeah. a couple of people in owner stories who are doing up their 912s at the moment. Um, but it scared me. And it was a thread. And, and it was about someone talking about, you know, if anyone's looking to do a Porsche factory classic restoration, Right, and he received a response mm-hmm. from Porsche, and this is a for this is just a forum post I found on BBS nine twelve forum. 
He said, I sent them some pictures of a beaten up 912 I was offered when looking for my car, and this is the response I received. I'm going to read it out to you. Thank you for reaching mm-hmm. out to us here at Porsche Classic. The 1966 912 looks like a fun project to restore, exclamation mark. Restoration costs vary depending on each car, so it can be difficult to estimate it properly. Over the last mm-hmm. 10 to 12 years, the lowest restoration cost, this is US dollars, by the way, was around mm-hmm. 250000 US dollars. But most of them, on average, are around 300000 US dollars. This is getting your car done by Porsche Classic. This, yeah, this 912 please, could be above please, and below. Sir, can, you, can you please, sir, remove your belt, drop your trousers? Yeah. And... <laughs> no, this gets, Steve, this gets better. Let me read the rest of it. This 912 could be above or below the $300,000 mark. But that can only be determined after the car is completely disassembled, once you've signed on the dotted line, right? And has gone mm-hmm. through the chemical bath to remove all the paint and rust to see what we have to work with. Now, if they put mm-hmm. your car in the chemical bath and there's nothing left, what do you have to pay? Are you still paying half the restoration cost? Two hundred and fifty. It says 250 to 300K. This is the guy's response. It seems extremely steep for a 912 unless it's a fairly family heirloom or has tremendous sentimental value. He says it will be impossible mm. to justify this kind of price. I agree with him. I agree with him. And this, you know, it always oh. looks appealing. Porsche Classics in Melbourne. These Porsche Classic centers are set up. Geneve, Geneva. Um, Steve, what do you think of those prices? Yeah, of course I think it's insane. Um, and I'm sorry this podcast has weirdly de- descended into conversation about values because I hate no, but it's not about, about values, But it's but... not about values. It's about choices. Well, do you know what I mean? It is about choices no, of like no. people think about getting the a po- classic and restore it. And I'm one of them. And I never realized it was this much. What I was going to make is that value is obviously personal to the individual. It's like what you're willing to kind of, you you perceive what you're kind of getting and then what you're willing to kind of pay for it. So, for example, if you're willing to pay a premium to kind of go to Bahrain, Rolex and pay like a thousand over um, and you're happy to kind of do that and you can afford it because you're a rich man, no problem. That's cool. That That's your prerogative because that's you. Um, I probably would behave, I think, differently in the same scenario, like that literal kind of Rolex sort of thing. But I get why you would do it. Um, It's just more that there seems to be like a basic assumption that that is now what everybody will do. And um, the price for everything has kind of just gone mental. And you don't that it's almost like the choice has been taken away from you you don't have an option anymore basically yeah there's no like if option you want in yeah then that's that's kind of what you got to do and that's well i don't know that's kind fomo of sad, it's fomo right it's crypto term which yeah. is coming into our into our vocabulary even more fomo fear of missing out it really is it's fear yeah. of missing out um and that's what it yeah, is yeah, we yeah. all worry that we're going to miss out we've missed out i keep we keep talking about it we've missed out you know there's another little part because i kind of go there's Sorry, another... like just use the watch. Go, go back to the watch analogy for a sec. Like I know this sort of started with, hey, check out the Porsche Design watch for seven seven thousand seven hundred US. Um, I'm guessing. Actually, I was going to ask you this, but I'm hypothetically going to guess that I would have said to you, okay, so like if you hate that watch, what would you do with the seven thousand seven hundred? My guess is that you might actually say, well, I'd get the um, Oyster Perpetual. Um, how much is an Oyster Perpetual US? Uh, seven, seven? Less, it's probably less close to seven, it. Right? I only know it in pounds. It's four thousand seven hundred pounds, so it's yeah. close to it, close so to that mark. Yeah, I, I, I just kind of go like, me personally, it's like, well, if all of a sudden a seven seven oyster perpetual um, goes up to eight seven because somebody deems that they can take you for a okay. bit of a ride, like I'll take my seven seven and I'll go and buy myself a Grand Seiko or something, like. And the, you know, like you, you have choices, like you don't have to. I, yes. And I know the whole thing, like when you bring it back to Porsches as well, you know, like your dream is to kind of attain the 911 or whatever else, but like, At what cost? I don't know, depending on what it is, I suppose, like it's just a bit kind of tragic that it's kind of gotten to this. <laughs> Well, it's becoming unreachable. I don't like when it, things become yeah. unreachable. You know what I mean? Exactly. And uh, maybe there, maybe there's listeners who, who are listening today who know of other places where you can get a restoration. And I guess a lot of people do restorations themselves. And I'm watching a really cool mm. one, like I said, on a, I think last week or the week before episode, to, uh, last week's episode to Ashmal, that have done yep. the gray color that I really like, which is like a really light gray. 
um, I think it's 912 Restoration or something Instagram. It's a really cool color. Like, and they're doing it most, they're obviously doing some things themselves and putting it to different shops. If you get someone to, yep. to look after the whole restoration for you, it's expensive. And the reason why I found this post, Steve, is I was looking because I was thinking, you know, if I buy a, a 912 that's not matching numbers and it's, it's body wise, hopefully body wise and floor wise, it's not rusted that bad. You know, you get it painted in Sydney or maybe you get it done in London if it's bought or in the US. Maybe you leave it in the US, and but that means having someone move it around for you. This is just a thought. Mm-hmm. I'm just thinking of different scenarios here. And make it so mm-hmm. it's more yours, right? So it's just customized mm-hmm. to you. It's not a matching numbers car. It's not like that. It's just a car that you want to enjoy. So therefore, you want to tweak the engine. And I was looking at engine rebuilds. And that surprised me too because I was finding things saying, you know, it's it's 30,000 starting point, you know what I mean? Like 30,000 or 25,000 US starting point. And I'm thinking, oh my God, like I, I just, I'm just so far removed from these costs. And then I found yeah. another post, you know, based on, that was Porsche Classic prices. You know, if someone's looking at restoring their 911 through Porsche Classic, and I'm guessing that's great. You could probably get really beautiful documentation and it's done by a Porsche center. And if you live in Europe and you take it to Porsche Classic Geneva and, and you know, they do it for you or Porsche Classic in Atlanta, you know, it's probably a really cool thing to do, you know? Um, but 300000 on a 912, I think, is a little bit insane. There was another post, the same person I think it was, or someone responded to it. And they, I'm not going to mention the shop's name, um, but it was some shop that does Ralph Lauren's um, cars. And mm-hmm. the guy that owns that shop apparently said to this person that basically 300000 US is the starting point for a 911 restoration. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a lot. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's a lot. Um, 300,000, you know, for a restoration. So, I mean, I guess this is why people are searching out 911s, 912s that are original, that are well looked after, and people are paying these prices, Steve, like for a 911T that, that sells on Bring a Trailer for 250,000 or whatever because it's, or 180, well, I don't know what they sell for now, but whatever price it is at the top end of that price point, people will pay that money because they know what the restoration cost is. And if they can find one that's, pretty good you know pretty sound then it's quite a good financial decision don't you think Mm, yeah (laughs) i don't know (laughs) i don't know my head's spinning a little bit because (laughs) i just kind of go like in all seriousness i kind of go like the numbers that are getting bandied about now they're just crazy like they're high it's and i uh, it go back to the watch analogy. I feel the same way about like the numbers that get bandied about with Rolexes and stuff because, like at the end of the day, I still kind of go, they're nice watches, but like they're made in the millions. They're not made in yeah, like but- thousands. They're not like a Patek kind of thing. So, um, I know that people want them, and I know that they're desirable, and I know that like the demand is the thing that drives the market price to yep. a degree. Yeah, but is it really still worth like all of this kind of craziness? It's like it's worth with, it if with, you enjoy it. It's like anything, right? You have yeah, to, yeah, you yeah, don't yeah. buy it as we, as other people say, and we've, you don't buy a watch, you don't buy a 911 or Porsche to make money. Don't think you're going to make money. Buy it because you can afford it. Buy it because you enjoy it. You know what I mean? You and I mm. enjoy mm. wearing our watches. We enjoy wearing watches. It gives me joy. You know what I mean? I've said this, you know, the yeah. other day I was wearing my, um, you know, I was wearing my Batman, actually. My, I'll call it Batman, even though I hate calling that, but it's people call it Batgirl, mm. the BLNR GMT Master, the blue, right? And when I went out mm. with Nick in London, and, you know, I hadn't worn that watch in a long time, and I wore it with Nick. We went and had a drink uh, second time I met up with him, and, you know, he made the point about how sparkly it was. But that's what I noticed when I was walking to the, to the bar, you know. I was looking at my wrist thinking, this is such a beautiful watch, you know what I mean? And you just look down, and I mm-hmm. look at the watch, and I go, it's like how you look at a Porsche, look back at your Porsche, you go, wow, that's just beautiful. I'm, I'm, I'm lucky, I love my car, I love it. I look down at my watch, I mm-hmm. love this watch, it looks beautiful. I don't look down at it and go, oh, I'm glad this watch is now worth you know, tw- uh, 50% more than I bought it for. I don't mm-hmm. think that. That doesn't come into your frame of mind. And I think if, if you're one of those sort of people, that's what comes into your mind. Like you look back at your car and go, oh, shit, I'm glad I... You know, I'm glad that, that I've got that loan, but at least now I can pay it off. You know what I mean? You don't mm-hmm. look at it. You can't look at it that way because you'll always be stressed. You'll always be worried. And, and that's not the way to do it. Yep. Hey, um, off the point for a second. I, tell me about what you bought. You said you, uh, I watched, I listened to that podcast actually on Smoking Tire with, um, I always quite like that Larry guy from Emma, New York City. Oh, he's a Larry bit serious. Casilla. He's a bit more serious, isn't he, than um, Matt Farah. But he's... Um, kind of what I like about him is um, yeah. a bit more intense kind of thing but um, 
he's just obvious like you can tell that his personality is suited to kind of being like the world's best detailer because he's just so uh he gets so kind of fixated and so obsessive about things um yeah and it was interesting so, though that his wife is a chemist i didn't realize that he said his wife's a chemist yeah, i didn't realize that either but yeah. he makes all um, his own products but that was interesting and for the listeners if you haven't listened to it you should go and listen to it um it's i think it was last week's episode He's um, Mike Musto, who's a journalist, right? Yep. He's a journalist. Yep, he's in the crowd with Johnny Lieberman and um, Matt Farrer and all those guys. He's an American car journalist and he owns a, what was it, a black 997 C4S? Well, you said 997. I thought it was 996, but you said 997, so I'll believe you. I thought it was 997. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't seen it. I'm, they, he talked about the fact that... Um, uh, Larry Casilla actually lives in New York. He's obviously gone out to um, the West Coast to visit Matt Farah, where Mike Musto is, and then he's gone and worked on um, Mike Musto's um, Black Porsche. And he made mention somewhere in the podcast, or they both did, like um, that um, that the paintwork on 997s is out of the factory isn't necessarily all that good. Like, yeah, oh, no, that worried me. I thought, you know what I thought? I thought in that point, yeah. I thought, shit, I'm going to buy a cheap um, paint gauge off Amazon, which is quite funny what you told me. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, because I, I mentioned it like in a couple of podcasts, uh, a few podcasts ago that I was getting getting kind of ready to try to get a little bit of gear to just sort of start um, trying to do a paint correction on my car. I've been watching like tons of videos and all of that. So I did, I had done that. I bought not the full kind of stuff. Like I just bought like a little um, uh, uh, dual action uh, machine to kind of get the whole thing going. Like what, what I was intending was, cause I can't go and um, go down to the car and spend like a dedicated three straight days doing it. Like my wife would absolutely kill me. Like trying to sneak downstairs for like an hour or two hours is hard enough um, as it is. Cause with little kids and all that sort of stuff with home duties. So um, I've started the little journey on sort of trying to kind of figure out how to um, do a paint correction on my car. And one of those steps, so as a kind of little side thing was um, I, when you start watching all these videos, like they kind of basically sort of say, look, one good thing to do is go and buy a paint depth gauge. Yeah. Because it will give you a bench. It doesn't sort of, how do I explain this? It doesn't, it doesn't literally, it's not like you kind of take a measurement, then you start kind of going and polishing your car and you try to take another measurement and try to work out how much paint you've taken off your car or clear coat you've taken off your car. You, you can't actually physically do that. Um, but what it does do, because I went and bought like a relatively cheap one, I think it was about 130 bucks. There's wow. my recommendation for this week. It's expensive. Uh, Cheap-ish paint depth gauge don't buy the there's ones that you can buy for 40 bucks but i read reviews about them and people said they were useless so what's the brand it. is it a particular brand particular uh, place I can't remember. that's uh, not a very good recommendation gas, can't remember gastools.com.au um uh they all look like you can tell that they're all kind of made in china and stuff like that but you obviously want one that sort of functions okay and that you can um calibrate it so you know that it's kind of taken accurate reading readings and stuff like that um but like the, the interesting thing about it was i got this kind of gauge and i started kind of just working like using it on my car and i'd i'd learned online that basically you can expect out of the porsche factory that um you can expect um roughly like i think it was about 110 to 120 microns is the depth of your base coat your paint your color and the clear coat on top right um and i went around my car like my 2008 white gd3 97.1 gd3 and like i was a little bit that was actually a little bit nervous about it because it's like oh fuck i hope i don't start taking those readings and i get like 230 on like you know, the door panel and <laughs> You know, three hundred. But that's good, right? More paint, the better. Yeah, because it obviously <laughs> means that it's crashed and like has been repaired. Um, and I know I didn't actually have that type of. Um, I had paint depth gauge wasn't run over it when I had the PPI done. So anyway, sorry. I went and got, went and did this, and it all checked out. So like in most places, in most places, I haven't been around the whole car. Like I'm doing because I'm doing this like an hour at a time. I'm kind of going panel by panel, really, really slowly. But um. 
Uh, so like in most places, yeah, I'd get a reading of about 110, but really, really strangely. So on the roof, it was like 100, 120 in places, 105 you know, in other places, but very strangely on the doors, both sides, um, near the bottom of the car, like lower, lower part of the door, like it got, it went down to about 85. Okay. Is that so dangerous like when it's much, that low? Much thinner on the bottom. So it's not, it's not necessarily dangerous or bad or whatever. It just means that like, now I put it in context of what I'm trying to do, which is learning to do this paint correction. It's just that, you know, that you have to be a lot less aggressive when you kind of start um, machine polishing, you know, the bottom part of the door, like don't, don't go hard, like using a wool mm. pad and um, like heavy mm. compound and stuff. Like you've got to be lo like a lot, lot more careful about it. Um, Maybe the bottom so yeah, of the door. I, I, I found that interesting. That's very interesting. Maybe the bottom of the doors are that way because when you're polishing your car, generally you sit on the ground and you do the bottom of the doors more than the top. So you've worn it down over the last five years. I don't <laughs> <laughs> it's your fault. No, don't it's not so. Porsche. You're blaming Porsche. I don't think you should blame yeah. Porsche. It could be you. How do you know? It's just weird though. Like, yeah, but it was a bit disconcerting to hear like mm. like um, Larry from Ammo kind of go, yeah, yeah, like, you know, 997 paint work is... 997 and 996. Same same boat, 996 and 997 are the same yeah. boat. And he said that I, this I, car, this car though, just for the listeners, that he can't do a paint correction on it. He's not doing a paint correction, remember? He said he's doing a detail yeah. because he's worried yeah. that there's not enough paint, you know? Yeah, what was yeah, the reading yeah, yeah. on it? I don't know if he said the reading, did he? He didn't. So he didn't talk about that, what I just kind of um, talked <coughs> you through kind of quickly. But I've, I've sort of read that because there's a point where rather than taking away from the paint you can buy certain things that basically fill the scratches rather than grind away at the clear coat to kind of get rid of the scratches um uh, look i'm not in that territory but yeah so i've kind of started horsing around with that type of thing you know i was thinking you know you said the other week um before you went yeah. off to make some money you said that um you couldn't do it in your car park because of the dust because you're, you know, in an apartment building and it was dust. Have you ever thought about if you were going to be in an apartment for, you know, for more of an extended time than you thought? So thought, would you get one of those um, bouncy castle things that go around your car, <laughs> and no, then you can completely, no you can buy one of those though for your car, but completely seal it. You have to wash your car less. You know what I mean? And when you're detailing it, it's a closed environment. No, one of my neighbors will want to go and pop it. <laughs> um, my neighbors already look at me like I'm a crazy man because. Um, what I've done is I've given the car a really, really good wash and it's not moved. Um, so now it's under the cover and then I peel back the cover like whenever I can kind of go downstairs and spend an hour yeah. to go and sort of work on a panel at a time and then I yeah. kind of cover it back up. So, um, yeah. I think you're losing your mind. It's, I think so because I'm the kind of weird guy that set up like a, a light, you know, like a proper light there to try to look at it properly. I get oh. a torch to kind of check the work that I'm doing. You have an LED time. light. I use my phone. Um, well, yeah, I don't know. I'd look, I'd be curious, like maybe there's people out there that know a lot more. I'm learning and like, honestly, I actually probably should learn on a different car rather than <laughs> my car, but I just do it on the Macan. The How's the Macan paint? Did you check the Macan paint yet? Uh, yeah, I did. Because uh, you said they're shit quality, um, you told me, the terrible quality compared to 997s, you told me last well, week. Well, because you can see more defects. Like I can literally kind of see more um, things like when I've kind of worked on it in the past. But actually, now that I've sort of started this kind of little thing of, you know, I've kind of done the back part of the car and stuff like that. But um, uh, I, ha I do now realise when you look really hard and you're kind of figuring it all out and you watch all these videos... I have definitely, <laughs> I have definitely put tons and tons of tiny kind of surface scratches on the car really? from like eight years of hand, hand waxing it. Yeah. So have you found anyone in Sydney that is a really good detailer that you would trust to do the car to do a paint correction on? Is there anyone out there that you've I heard haven't of? gone. Well, I haven't gone and looked at anyone because, um, perfectly honest, I don't really want to spend like two grand. Is that I'm what a paint correction thing. costs? Yeeps. Okay, because I want to... Um, I think you can get one cheaper. My uncle paid less than two, but... Um, and the guy that... Like, I had no idea. That was my second second encounter with, you know, sort of having any sort of conversation with, like, a kind of professional kind of car detailer. Yeah. Um, 
So, like, I don't know. Also because, like, you know, we're enthusiastic, blah, blah, blah. So I don't mind trying to have a go at sort of having, you know, working it out myself and um, trying to have a tilt at it. You know, like, it's not going to cost me two grand in materials to kind of do it. So you've started part of the car already or are you still doing the testing stage? You've started. So how's it? I've done the roof and part of the back of it and stuff. So how's it look? Good. Better? It actually looks good. Yeah, 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 better, better. Um, look, it's it's a funny kind of thing because you can kind of tell that it's one of those things that could drive you insane because um, the harder you look at it, you know, like if you stand, like if you go down to the garage and you set up all your lights and then you start looking at your car really hard, you'll find all these scratches and then you can start chasing them. And when, you, when I say chasing them, obviously that means that you you know pick a you pick a pad and you put it on your machine you you know you do a couple of passes and then you stop and you have a look at it and it's like oh shit there's still scratches there you can just keep going and going and going but what you're doing is you're grinding the clear coat down on your paint mm, mm. um till eventually you're going to burn through your paint and you're in a lot of trouble yeah um, that's scary there's no going back from that that's scary but um the reality of it is that i think that you can obviously go too far because when are you ever going to kind of look at your car under those sorts of lights and all of that sort of stuff? Like, you know, even when you're enthusiastic, um, I'll go and drive it out in the sunlight and you might spot the odd kind of little scratchy thing here or there, but you're never going to, you're never going to scrutinize it that bad. So yeah, yeah. even if I don't have the skills of a professional, like if I kind of take out say like 70% of like the kind of general surface scratching, it looks, it does look like quite a bit better. And like, I'm kind of happy with that. And I won't have spent two grand on it. Plus, hopefully, I will have enjoyed, you know, learning a little bit along the way. So mm, that's cool. That's cool. So far, it's not bad. Yeah. So you can give me so some tips when I come back, what, if I can get back. In yeah, what, yeah. In what yeah, year? Like, 2025 I, or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I genuinely think like, sort of knowing what you're like as a person i think it's the sort of thing that you probably enjoy as well you know like and i spent a lot of time texting my uncle because he sort of paid a guy to kind of do his 991.2 yeah and then he went and bought every bit of gear known to man but he's got like you know seven eight cars so he's yeah. now slowly working his way and taught himself how to do it so well, it's a good investment I when you have that many conversations cars. with him yeah. yeah yeah exactly i want to get a phone machine i know that i've been thinking about that but you know i want to get a lot of things you know, the foam washer, whatever Oh, it is. a foam machine. Yeah, I want to get one of those. Just yeah, it it's a cool. rabbit hole, man. Because Just because it think, looks cool. <laughs> well, the thing about this whole kind of car correction thing is that you start to realize that the trick is supposedly once you, once you, once you kind of correct your paint and you get it all nice, the, the trick from there is to not, you know, contact yeah, the paint Yeah, not to trash as, it afterwards. Um, and that gets costly too. So, but yeah, yep. I don't know. it's cool. It's fun. Before we go, mate, um, cause we've gone into the hour and a quarter, well, um, you. Luft, yep. Luft was on. Um, I'm very envious of all the people that sent me images. Uh, quite a few people mm. from quite a few of our listeners, people been on owner stories, went to it. Uh, Benjamin, uh, went to it from Mod Classic Cars. Um, is it Mod yep. Classic Cars? God, I hope that's the right Instagram, Benjamin, sorry, I haven't got in front of me. I think it, that's what you call yourself. Um, James at Auto Amateur was there. He took some photos, great photos. Um, Todd, Stone City Outlaw. There's a few other people as well. I, I can't remember everyone. There's quite a few people that went there. Um, great yeah, great right. uh, location, huh? The Coca-Cola factory in um, Indiana. Yeah, it's in cool. In Indianapolis. It's like really pretty cool. cool. Like, um, those guys like creatively like have a really good sort of sense of visual aesthetic about them like the the thing i thought the thing in universal studios the pri- previous one yeah. of six was amazing but even that bottle works thing just looks like a really cool location and i think you know like he's kind of carefully planned out um you know which car goes in terms yeah. of uh, matches with which backdrop and everything so the red on the red cool. look fantastic jeff swart and, and patrick yeah. long with jeff swart's the creative side of it jeff swart and patrick long they do a great it's such a great event yeah, you know yeah, what yeah. i mean I mean, I really like the yeah. one that was in the lumber yard, that one in the lumber yard where they're quite a few years back, I yep. think it was. That was a great one too. Yep. But like yep. I said, I forgot about the Universal studio back lot at, at the studios was a really cool one. And Coca-Cola Factory, yeah. how do they find these places and how do they get permission to use them? You know, like they're, it's, I don't know. I it's just such a great event. It really is such a great event. I take a guess that's what, because he's a um, director and advertising guy, he's going to know like lots of people in production and stuff. So he will have True. come across like 
tons of sort of locations in his career um but it's cool it's really cool he's definitely good at spotting locations i don't know you see luft and you know it just reminds you steve of how great um the porsche community is you know what i mean you see that mm. um even the amount of people that were sending me images from it and, and sharing it and tagging me because they knew i'd be interested you know seeing a 912 and saying you know i thought about you when i saw this um it just yep. makes me realize you know this whole porsche community and you know the community that you and i are part of with this podcast which we've become you know, accidental heroes or not accidental heroes we've accidentally fallen into. And, we, and, you know, it's part of that whole community. Um, and it's part of the Porsche ownership. You know what I mean? It's like we were saying before, you don't buy it for the money, you buy it for the car, you buy it for the experience, you buy it for, for these interactions, mm-hmm. which, you know, um, which are great. You know what I mean? And, and I guess to people outside of Porsche, just look at us like we're all obsessive and all crazy. But when you see something mm-hmm. like Luft and you see people share it, um, it's just, a, I don't know, I think it's a great thing. Especially during, you know, being locked down and stuff like that. It's just a, it's a really cool thing. They had a pretty good turnout, right? I'm sure they, yeah, they would. Yeah. Hey, is there, um, is it Luft? Because I know by sort of translation, it literally is um, air-cooled, right? Say the full word. So like, Luftgegolt. It's, Luftgegolt. It's, it's, um, it, is it, um, do they stick to that? Is it exclusively air-cooled stuff? I think so. Oh, I, I, it, it looks like it. it but, yeah, no, it is. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it is. I mean, such a, you know, yeah, you yeah. have this small event, you know, I think Patrick Long was talking about it when they first did it, you know, such a small thing. And now it's become such a, such a huge thing. You know what I mean? Um, two of yeah. my favorite things though, you know, Luft um, and Luft's merchandise they do. And then, you know, I keep saying period correct. I really like what that guy does. I like his style. Yeah. Um, you know, not just Porsche related, but I just like those two things together. Um, do you I just think w- it made me... It made me kind of wonder too, like, do you think there is um, really the kind of divide between air-cooled enthusiasts and water-cooled enthusiasts that there used to be? Like, I reckon that's sort of just I think maybe it's, become a bit of a thing of the past. I think it's blurring a little bit. I think, yeah. you know, people have air-cooled also have water-cooled cars now. I think when 996 and yeah. 997 are starting to end a classic status, I think it's changing slightly. Um, obviously, there's yeah. people that still want just the air-cooled cars, but I think more people are appreciating the 996 and 997 than they did before. Yeah, yeah. Um, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think because so. I like think... A, you're probably no longer firmly like one foot in a particular camp anymore and you can still appreciate the other one just as yeah. just as much. And I think, mate, it's because, because of the 992, the 992s help the 996 more than the 997 at the moment, I think, because it makes it look like even though people thought the 996 and 997 were so far removed from the air-cooled, mm. it is removed, but when you now see the 992, that's the reference point. You know what I mean? So the kind of the divide between the 993 to 996 to 997, it, maybe it's not as not as jarring for people. You know what I mean? It's not because mm-hmm. they're, 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 their reference point is now the 992, which is, you know, so modded and, and so, you know, 2021. Don't you yep, think? Yep, yep. Hey, um, yeah, I, I just so. want to do, I just want to go back to the Porsche community because I just want to do, um, not really a shout out, but I just want to mention a couple of people here. Um, but like I said, Luft 7, you know, these sort of things I think is great. Um, I just want to do a couple of shout out because, you know, this whole podcast, you know, I get a lot of DMs, Steve. A lot of people I answer. I know you get a few. Um, a lot of people I answer. Um, sometimes oh, yeah. I don't answer in, in depth. Eventually I do. Uh, but this Porsche community, this common thread through owner stories where people say they really love that how they've come into Porsche and this community is so strong and everyone is so genuine and, and generous and friendly. And I, I really do think that is the case. You know, I didn't always think it was the case, I have to admit, but due to some places that I sort of used to read in forums and stuff, but I really do think it is the case. And I just want to say two things. I just want to say a thank you to Benjamin, who's been on um, owner stories before. Um, I'm not going to say what it's for. I don't want to like call it out that much, but they've just been very kind and they've just done some really, uh, a couple of nice, Benjamin's done a really nice gesture. I just want to say thank you. Um, and also um, Jared or Gerard, um, who's got a 944 he's sorting out. Um, he's, he's also offered to do something for me and it's a really nice gesture and I just want to say thank you. And I think that's what's, what's great, that, that, that people... You guys, you listeners, appreciate me and Steve talking and you appreciate the owner stories and you feel like you want to do something. And I think that's uh, it's a nice thing, especially during, you know, this period that we're all going through. Steve. Yeah, good. Um, yes, Michael. I think that's it. Um, I've just realized, you know what I've just realized? What? 
and I realized it before, is that we usually record this on a Wednesday. We're recording it on a Thursday. Um, yep. For the Patreon members, it comes out 24 hours before. That means I have to have this done before through, edited before <laughs> 3 o'clock this <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> oh, my God. I just realized I have to edit this podcast now before 3 o'clock this afternoon so the Patreon members get it because um, I actually have to do work today. So um, my wife is still asleep. I'm going to have to edit this right now and get it done because um, I've got a seriously busy day today. And also I'm doing another owner's stories tonight. I'm doing an owner's stories at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock tonight. Something like that. We'll leave you to it then. <laughs> Get cracking, man. <laughs> um, welcome back, Steve. Oh, before we go, Thanks, before man. we go, um, I just want to say to the listeners, you know, I've, I've thought, uh, I have actually thought, and Steve knows I've been pondering this backwards and forwards, and I, I, just, I just didn't know what to do, and I thought I was going to do this um, maybe four weeks ago. At the moment, um, the workload uh, for Steve as well and the workload for me is really, really heavy. Um, and I know this is a bit boring. And also I'm about to, like I said, a project that we've been working on since 20, well, late 28, beginning of 2018 is now coming to a head. Um, I'm off to Dubai on Saturday uh, until first week of October. So what I've decided to do, and I've really thought about this, Steve, and you know I've been pondering it back and forth. I'm going to just, um, we're just going to take a two week break on the podcast. I know people are going, no, no. But it gives you guys time to catch up on the episodes. I know a lot of people have listened to a lot of the previous episodes. It gives you some time to catch up on the episodes. Uh, we don't want you guys to get sick of us either. Um, but I do need the next two weeks. It's, no, it's, that, man. <laughs> there's no way. There's no way I can do the. Uh, I, I can do the. I mean, I've recorded. You know, I'm record, I recorded owner stories last night, and I'm recording another one and another one. So I, I have the owner stories up my sleeve. But I just want to just give it a two week break because it still involves work for me, and my head is going to be elsewhere when I'm in Dubai. So um, I'm just going to put the podcast on a break, Steve. We're just going to put it on a break till um, the next owner stories will come up on the 5th of October. Tuesday, the 5th of October will be the next owner stories. Um, so you guys will have an owner stories then. But for the next two weeks, I think it's two weeks, isn't it? Yeah, for the next two weeks, um, there won't be any episodes um, being published. Uh, but on the 5th of October, they will be back again. Thanks, Steve. Are you cool with that? I didn't yeah. ask you about that, but I just did it. So. Come on, I'm a guest. It's all right. No problem. Steve's the host. Steve's the host. I um, uh, yeah. I'm in a world of pain with um, uh, <laughs> just trying to look after things at home anyway. Just yeah. Steve's got to catch up on his sleep, make some more money. Yeah, yeah. Makes other money things, in his so. sleep. That's what the thing. Passive income. I've got this big thing at the moment. Passive income. You know, I'm earning passive income at the moment, and I love it. How um, are you doing that? Oh, while I sleep. While I sleep, it's great. I wake up in the morning yeah. and I've made money. It's just great. Maybe that's why I'm so poor because like I don't <laughs> sleep, so I don't. You got to earn money while you work, while during the day and when you're sleeping. That's the new thing. That's the well, thing no, for the next generation. Neither of these things are happening at the moment. Well, we need to talk. We need to talk. I got some <laughs> tips for you. I got some investment yeah, tips. Okay. Not not financial advice. Not investment tips. Just you know, hobby tips. Uh -huh. Okay, everyone. Okay, Steve. Thanks, mate. I'll let you go. No worries. Cheers, man. Anything you want to say care. to the Have listeners before we go? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Simple everyone. As that, no? <laughs> Simple as that. Simple as that. Um, I had uh, uh, Bobby, Bobby, who was on um, last week's Owner Stories number fifty, um, the one before me. He mm. had a gr he he named you something. He had a name for you, and it was a fantastic name. And I goddamn forgot it. A good friend of mine called me a misanthrop once, and it's like I don't even know what that means. <laughs> I looked it up, and it's like, yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> Somebody I, who hates humanity. <laughs> oh, really. No, Something you along those lines. <laughs> That's not a very nice thing to say to your friend. That's okay. It, if, if it's true, it's okay. Are you still friends with him? <laughs> yeah. Okay. My mate Todd. It's cool. Thanks, Steve. Let's go. Uh, see ya. All right. That's it, everyone. Uh, thanks for listening to the Portugal podcast. That's Steve. Um, GT3997. I won't do his Instagram handle because he doesn't want anyone to follow him. Um, my name is Michael Bath, and that's it for today. Bye for now. <laughs>